Do you have solo economic dependency? That is, if you aren't working, you aren't making money. The Art of Passive Income Podcast is the solution. Discover passive income models so you can enjoy life on your own terms. Let freedom ring. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And today's guest is a little bit different. Very cool, but different, which I'm super pumped about because I love learning about new models and new niches in order to build wealth. However, before we talk to our guest, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host. You know him. You love him. Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. If you're not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Learn anything about anything, investorninjas.com. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm great. Um, are, you, are you ready for this, uh, this, uh, this guest? I can't wait. I want to learn something new. I, I am too. I love learning something new. So our guest today is Bob Frazier from AspenFunds.us. If you're not familiar with Aspen Funds, Bob started it in 2012 to take advantage of a unique opportunity in residential real estate notes. So after experiencing the volatility of the stock market and seeing investors take large losses in their portfolios, Bob and his partner Jim were determined to design an investment fund that would provide excellent investor returns and, um, and, and without the volatility of traditional investment options. So Jim spent 30 plus years career in real estate and in 2010 began looking into the mortgage note space. And through all his experience in real estate, understood that the financing was always the key. Scott Todd, does that sound familiar? It does, yep. Yeah. And that through all the ups and downs of real estate investing, it was the banks who always seemed to survive and thrive. Bob Frazier, welcome to the podcast. How are you? It's awesome to be here with you. So, so Bob, let's just rewind the tape a bit and kind of give us your background and why of all the real estate niches you chose, you chose residential real estate mortgage-backed notes. Sure. Well, you know, I'm really not a real estate guy. I was kind of a, I was a tech guy. I uh, am a computer scientist from Berkeley, was a programmer for many years, ended up starting a dot com back in the 90s, ended up raising $40 million in venture capital and growing this thing to 300 employees. And then it blew up and I lost everything um, in the late 90s. Uh, and really, you know, after that, did a hedge fund, started a hedge fund, really got kind of what I call a, you know, a finance finance degree, a street MBA, you know. I say, you know, street MBAs, they're, 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 they're better than regular MBAs, but they're way more expensive. And uh, yeah, so, uh, but again, when the crash of 2008 happened, I lost everything in this hedge fund. And so really at that point, became a real estate guy. I'm like, you know, you know, I want something that is a little more predictable, a little more controllable than, than, you know, a fat investment in the stock market. I mean, my partner, Jim is a real estate guy and uh, he lost everything in the crash. So this is kind of our theme, right? You know, you know, these massive cycles, economic cycles come and we want something that is, that is, you know, far less dependent on the cycles or, or something that is, that is um, uh, uh, counter cyclical, right? And so we found it with note investing. And uh, so we buy, we buy these notes, uh, you know, and, and partly too, I, you know, turned some passive income, bought a, 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 a duplex and it was just such a horrible experience, you know, uh, for, for computer scientists, you know, these fingers do magic and a keyboard, but boy, you know, try to fix a piece of drywall or a toilet and I'm just lost. So it was way over my head and it was no fun at all. And so that's when I decided to get into this, this, the finance arena, which is really a lot more suitable to me. And, you know, real estate based finance is just so much cleaner, so much more scalable, so much more upside, um, so much more controllable in, in so many ways than any other thing I've ever touched. 
Yeah, Todd, I think all these benefits sound very familiar to you and me in our land investing model. But I just want to get your thoughts, Scott, on on all of this. No, I agree. I think that uh, the the thing is that, you know, it's not necessarily about, um, to, to me, it's not, our business is not about necessarily owning the land. It's really about putting that land onto a note right. and converting that into paper, right? Creating I think that paper. the paper's worth much more than the, than the real estate itself because the paper, the, the land, the land payments, it's what sustains us, you know, every month, like every month, I don't have to wake up and worry about like, oh man, I got to flip, flip two properties or three properties right. this month. It, it takes a lot of stress off, even though you do get addicted to seeing the growth in your, your paper uh -huh. portfolio or the paper that you're generating. Ultimately, I was told a long time ago, uh, paper is gold. That's what I was told a long time yeah. ago. Yeah. So you, you turn your asset into cash flow. And yeah. Uh, yeah. so we, 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 buy, we buy real estate based cash flows, primarily owner occupied, uh, um, residential, you know, real estate. Um, we buy it at a discount almost entirely. So we buy, you know, we don't do our own originations. So you, you, what you guys are doing with seller financing, you're originating a piece of paper. We don't, we buy distressed paper. Um, um, and we typically buy at a discount. And so, so the advantage so that has is that we, yeah. we get enhanced yields because of the discount. Plus in a refinance or sale event, we have a cap gain in addition. So we get cash flow plus cap gain. So let's, let's unpack that a little bit for the listener because you, you, you really said a, a, few, a few things that our listeners may not be familiar with. The number one is origination. You're not doing that. So you're taking somebody, let's take Scott, for example, who lives in his house and the bank has the first mortgage on his house. Mm -hmm. You are not buying that first mortgage, correct? You know, we are buying that first mortgage. You are buying that first mortgage. We don't, okay, so we don't originate, means we don't create the paper. We simply purchase the paper. Okay, so the bank already has the paper. They yes. already have, so Scott's paying the bank. Yes. However, now let's go, let's, let's define distress. So what does that look like? Why do well, you get this at a discount? Typically, these are, these are notes that were not being paid for a period of time. And they maybe they were modified. So if you don't pay your mortgage, sometimes you can talk to your bank and they will modify the loan. And once modified, it's called a troubled debt restructure from a bank. And once a troubled debt restructure, always a troubled debt restructure. Doesn't matter if that borrower's FICO, you know, credit score goes back up to 800. Doesn't matter if they're making a million dollars a year. Doesn't matter if they're paying on time. It is still a, a garbage loan. It's a troubled debt restructure. It's a black eye. So these things get sold. So the banks end up selling them off uh, to clean their books. Um, a lot of times they sell bad loans, the loans that are non-performing because banks don't know what to do with them. They're bought by specialty funds and hedge funds and other investors who re-perform the loans or, or uh, take possession of the property and, uh, and create seller financing. Once they do those things, they have a piece of paper that they no longer want. It's simply a cash flowing, boring piece of paper and they want to get their money out. So they sell it. So we buy in the secondary market um, performing notes, basically. Okay, so, but they are performing once you get to them, but because they've been troubled, you get we them at a it. discount and your yield is way higher. Can we define when we say higher yield, what would a traditional note look like compared to your note? All right, here, here's an example. It's a little New York, upstate New York house, a little tiny house. It's a $100,000 house. He has a $100,000 loan on this. I think it's a 6% interest rate on this loan. He's paying $579 a month, okay? We bought that loan for $50,000. So literally he owes us $100,000. His house is worth $100,000. He doesn't know that we paid 50,000 for that note. So instead of a 6% a, uh, yield, um, so the note is a 6%, he's paying 6%, uh, you know, per year, but because we paid 50 cents for that, we're getting a 12% yield because we only paid 50 cents on the dollar. And then what's more, 
So he's paying us every month, $566 a month or whatever it is. And uh, when he refinances or sells that house, he pays us off. He pays our note off. The new, the new buyer will, 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 will satisfy the previous debt. And so we'll get how much? Well, we're not going to get 50. We're going to get 100. So we end up making a 12% yield on that paper until we earn a, a 100% cap gain. Like this, Scott exactly. Todd. Exactly, we do too. <laughs> Your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's great. I mean, you know, like in, anything that uh, you know drives the yield higher is definitely uh, a good deal. So, yeah. Bob, I, I would assume this is a due diligence model, where when you're looking at this tranche of notes of distressed notes from your 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 bank, let's say, do you get a chance to pick and choose? which notes you want and which notes you don't? It it's, depends on the seller. We have, we have tons of sources, um, <clears throat> but we, we generally underwrite every note individually. Um, you have to do that. Uh, and generally we do have a right to put back loans and exclude them from the pool saying this doesn't meet our criteria. Um, but yeah, I, it's definitely an underwriting process. We're, we're very sophisticated uh, underwriters using, you know, discounted cash flow models. We look at every possible scenario, every possible outcome for this note, including default scenarios. And we build a cash flow for each one. And based on our experience, we assign a probability to each one. And we, that becomes a cap, uh, uh, a price that we pay for that, for that note. And, and, you know, there's really no such thing as a bad note to us. It's just a bad price. There's no such thing as a bad note. It's just a bad price. And right. you are very comfortable with the asset being a, a residential home because what's the worst case scenario for you? We, and the worst case scenario, we, we probably had it, right? Where property prices declined by 35% across the nation you know, so, you, you know, you definitely want equity in these things. We look at what a metric, a key metric we call investment to value, meaning our cost basis relative to the value of the home. Um, and we include, we buy a lot of second mortgages. We actually prefer second mortgages. Yes, you heard that right. And I'll tell you why. Uh, but we look at total investment, total debt on this property, um, measured by our cost basis and a senior note relative to the price of the property. And we like to keep that at 65% or, or less so, so that we can weather a downturn and, you know, the borrower may have, you know, their, watch their equity get, you know, decrease, but we're, we're safe um, as the lender. Um, so, you know, we, we love seconds. People, people are terrified of seconds. And I'm so glad they are um, because it creates huge inefficiencies in the market. So second mortgage, so a typical first mortgage is maybe around 4% coupon rate, in, you know, interest rate. Second mortgage is typically double that. So maybe a 4% rate, but are there any risk here? It, it's really not. It really depends on the property and the, the debt stack. So if it's a $300,000 property, there's a $100,000 first at 4%. And $100,000 second at 8%, which one would you rather have? Well, I'll, I'll take the second all day long, especially since the first, I probably can't get a discount on that first mortgage. On the second, I may get a 50% discount. So I'll buy a $100,000 loan, which is at 8%, and I'll get it for, you know, 50, 60, 70 cents on the dollar. So I love seconds. And then what happens when there's when there's a sale or a, refinancing, we get a capital gain. So we, we far prefer seconds, um, but we do have, we do have in our portfolios, we typically have quite a bit of first just for the safety factor of, you know, um, having, having first that where there's really nothing that can happen to these loans. So Scott right. and I are, are what you would call ambitiously lazy. <laughs> and we certainly aren't going to go outside of our, our own niche even though we might love this model. So what could we expect as investors investing in Aspen funds as far as a return? Gotcha. 
well, it's a it's a pretty cool um, fund. We made a we made a passive income fund because you know a lot of people, most people want the passive income, and you know it is difficult to to do. You know our 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 uh, industry is heavily regulated. You know it's we're we're lenders, so you do have to know what you're doing with laws and licenses, et cetera. So we manage all that. We do all the due diligence. We have you know, of course, lots of sources, and we typically pay 8.5% um, uh, cash return on an annual basis paid monthly, monthly basis. So it's real nice, you know, it's mailbox money. And it's, here's the other really cool thing. Uh, this is a huge differentiator for from us versus most of the real estate funds, which you have a lockup. Typical real estate funds, you've got a you know, I mean, I've seen them at 10 year lockups. You literally cannot get your money for 10 years. Well, who wants that? You know, we have hundred percent liquidity on any, at any quarter. Um, we actually price our notes, uh, our, our portfolio every quarter. We come up with a net asset value price of the fund. It's a per share price and you can put more money in at that price. You can take money out at that price. And how do we do? We, we've literally been operating for seven years now, have never failed to meet a liquidity need for an investor. How do we do that? Well, we have 350 loans in our portfolio right now. 8% of them will refinance or sell every year. And when that happens, we get cash coming in. It's because we have so many notes, there's always a liquidity event. So every quarter, uh, people want to get their money back. They just send me a note saying, I want X bucks back at the end of the quarter. I just reserve that much cash as it comes in and we're able to pay our investors. So it's kind of a, you know, you can have your cake and eat it too. Uh, you know, so we give pretty much unlimited liquidity, quarterly liquidity. We do require a one year lockup is all, but then after that, um, it's unlimited liquidity and, a uh, eight and a half percent return, hundred percent passive. So, um, so it's you know it's it, honestly this this asset class really yield, lends itself to a really attractive income product. That's hot. What are your thoughts? Okay, so here here's my uh, question. Mark and I invest in raw land, just the land, no house, scary, scary nothing. Scary. Okay, <laughs> like. Raw land. I take this land and I put it on a note. Okay. Uh, like I don't run credit on my buyer. Right. Okay. It's a low down payment to the, to the total purchase price. I've got this note. Will you buy it? I, I probably wouldn't buy it because there's no underlying cash flow on, on that, uh, on that property. So there's, there's nothing to support the value, right? Except there's no cash flow to support the value, if you will. And you see, like, it, my, my point behind that is is this, like, what's, and it's really for the, not, 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 look, I'm not, I'm not dissing you. I'm just, I want the audience to, to listen to this piece, right? Like, therein lies the, the opportunity. Like, Bob, Bob talked about the second mortgages and being an inefficient market, right? Like, and how he's benefiting from the inefficient market. Mark and I, and the other land investors in this community, we are beneficiating beneficiating from the uh, the inefficient market. And if if Bob won't buy your paper, I will buy your paper. <laughs> so like because I understand it. Like Bob understands his world, and that's cool. I understand our world. You need money? Come talk to me. I'll do it. I know Mark will buy paper too. So like you see, you got to find people. There's, there's value in the assets, as I said, and you got to find the people that understand that component of it. And, you know, a lot of times I know when I started, I went to people like Bob, like, will you do this? And the response I got, like I kidded you a hundred times was exactly what Bob said. And I, and I argued not, not disrespectfully, but I would say like, Bob, there is cash flow coming from these because I sold it once on the note. It's there. The cash flow is there and the yield is there to support it. And the, the Bobs didn't were like, no, nah. because you see, they're accustomed to their niche and that's cool. And yeah, I really I, think. I, and you're right. I mean, traditional, traditional lenders are, are, you know, you look at, you want to have income to pay, to pay, you know, 
uh, on real estate, you want to have income to pay the to pay the debt service. And so on land, right, there really isn't that. So you're creating paper, um, but it doesn't have an underlying income on it. You know, I, it doesn't fit our model, but right. And see, that's that's not, the thing. It's like not to say that I wouldn't start a fund, an income fund, to do that because we like all cash flows. But in our right. fund, we we will not buy those. But you know, we we have we have five different funds, so right. that have different metrics. Right. Well, that, well, that so there's certainly a model that would work on that. I I totally yeah, agree right. with you guys. But see, yeah, like that, you know, that, yeah. Go ahead, Scott. But no, I was just gonna wrap up. I, see, like, and I, like, I'm not trying to like argue it one way. That I just want to, I just want everybody to see, like, it's it's all about perspective, right? Like, Bob knows this piece, and like what Bob said was, there's no income, underlying income from the land, and like for me, I could ar- easily say that, look, when that when that house is empty, there's no underlying income from that house in, either until it gets resold True. again, right? Like, True. That's, that's the piece. And so all I'm saying is like everybody, you got to understand like there, there's investments that we all make. And once you understand, once you understand it, see, Bob's not saying no because he doesn't like land. Bob's saying no because he doesn't understand what we do. That's really the ultimate it's, piece. Of- it's totally right. And it, it goes to really what you guys do and what we do. It's taking advantage of inefficient markets and, and finding niches that are very profitable niches in what we do. You know, we have another business, another strategy where we buy non-performing debt. And that just terrifies the heck out of people. But we so understand that market. Our margins are incredibly high and we make a lot of money on those on those things. But again, it's one of those things that people people just do not know how to how to go after this. And we're buying debt for as little as, you know, 10 cents, 15 cents on the dollar um, uh, that has a lot of value. It may not have cash flow but it has value. So we totally understand that. And uh, there's, there's, there's so much money to be made in, in so many different models. Yeah, absolutely. But that reminds me that today's podcast is sponsored by TL Folio. TLfolio.com. If you have a performing note and you need cash, you can sell 12 to 18 months of that cash flow. Take that money, redeploy it, put on a new note, and really get exponential returns for yourself. And then you get another bite of the apple after the note, uh, the, the 12 to 18 months, you get that passive income reverts back to you. So you get the cash and then you get the passive over there and we can walk you through the numbers. So tlfolio.com for your land notes. All right, Bob Fraser, we're at that point now in the podcast where your mentorship has been phenomenal. And thank you so much for educating us and our audience on uh, your your model and your fund. But now we're going to ask you for one more tip, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable for the art of passive income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? Okay. Are you ready to have your life completely changed for 2020? Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, there's a tool I use. It's called Microsoft Power BI, it's Power Business Intelligence. And I just cannot recommend this tool highly enough. It's basically lets you create data dashboards for any data, including finance data, spreadsheet data, and it lets you slice and dice this data in a live way. We do analytics on every one of our portfolios. I can tell you everything about my portfolios and I I can slice that data and dice it in seconds and minutes. It is one of the coolest tools and it's free to get started. Very cool. Scott Todd, this is super geeky. (laughs) Yeah, that's cool. Exactly. I love it. I love it. Powerbi.microsoft.com. Very cool. We'll have a a link to that in the notes. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Mark, my tip is just for you and others, but really I thought of you when I found this one. Check out the book, The Daily Stoic, 366 Meditations on Wisdom, Preservation, and the Art of Living on Amazon. I I love stoicism, and I believe that's Ryan Holiday, who wrote Ego is the Enemy. Yeah. Um, Okay, done. I'm going to get it. That's how I'm going to start. Uh, 2020 with my my stoic practice. Thank you so much. And now my tip of the week. This is going to be a one that's going to actually get you wealthy slowly and increase your passive income. Go to Aspen 
aspenfunds.us. I'll have a link to it, aspenfunds.us. And learn more about how you can just invest your money and make 8.5% on real estate-backed mortgage investments. The, uh, the risk-reward ratio seems very, very appealing. And if you have qualified retirement money, you have self-directed IRA money, and it's just sitting there, this is a great place to start getting that larger yield with, it sounds like, very, very little risk. Is that right, Bob? I would say so. All right. Well, um, Bob Frazier, are we good? Yeah. Pleasure to be here with you guys. Thank you so much. Scott Todd, are we good? Yeah, Mark, we're good. All right. I want to thank the listeners. Just remind you the only way, the only way we're going to get quality of guests like a Bob Frazier from AspenFunds.us is if you do three little things, you've got to subscribe, you've got to rate, you've got to review the podcast, send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We are going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit, as well as the new wholetailing course, how to double your money 30 days or less. All right, Scott, are you ready to do this? We are, Mark. One, two, three, let, let freedom, freedom ring. ring. Bob's like, if I knew you guys were going to end like that, I don't know if I would have <laughs> been on the podcast. All right, thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Start your journey at www.thelandgeek.com and www.scotttodd.net. Read and review the podcast and email support at thelandgeek.com. Your screenshot for a free passive income launch kit.